The first imaginative literature to come out of America was poetry. Yeah, there wasn't really any fiction as we know it today uh, to speak of at the time. That just wasn't a genre yet. And of course, the Puritans that inhabited uh, early colonial America wouldn't have stood for something as audacious as a stage drama. So yeah, poetry was the first literary genre to come out of America. And it came almost exclusively from New England. There really were no notable works coming from the southern colonies. The earliest published poetry in America comes from a guy named Samuel Danforth, uh, whose family immigrated to Massachusetts Bay in 1634. Uh, he went to Harvard, became a minister, uh, and he wrote a series of three uh, what he called almanacs, uh, which were collections of poems written for each month of those three years. The poems in his almanacs cover a wide range of topics, uh, mostly secular in nature, which is kind of unusual considering he was a minister. Um, but even though they are primarily secular in nature, you can still see a lot of evidence of his spirituality and, and uh, Christian beliefs in the poems. Um, a lot of his poems were what are called puzzle poems, which are sort of like riddles. They'll be about subject matter and part of reading the poem is kind of figuring out what the subject is and what everything means. Yeah, as if deciphering 400 year old poetry wasn't hard enough, right? Here's an example of one of his poems from his Almanac of 1647. This is the very first one, January. Great bridges shall be made alone without ax, timber, earth, or stone. Of crystal metal like to glass, such wondrous works soon come to pass. If you may then have such a way, the ferryman you need not pay. If you can't tell what he's talking about here, this is another one of those kind of riddle poems here or, or puzzle poems. He's talking about a wintertime and ice kind of freezing uh, the ponds and, and, and streams and that sort of thing. That's what that crystal metal is like to glass. Uh, and you don't have to pay the ferryman because you can just walk across the lake. Here's another example from August of that same almanac. Many this month I do foresee, together by the ears will be, Indian and English in the field, to one another will not yield. Some weeks continue will this fray, till they be carted all away. Yeah, here's kind of a common experience in frontier life, these uh, uh, skirmishes between the English settlers and the natives. And he's just kind of making a, a very simple commentary on that, how he doesn't think that these skirmishes will ever stop until they're all carted away dead and wounded. Here's another example from December, this one from the Almanac of 1648. Of late from this tree's root within the ground, rich mines branch out, iron and lead are found, better than Peru's gold or Mexico's, which cannot weapon us against our foes, nor make us hoes, nor scythes, nor plowshares mend, without which tools men's honest lives would end. Some silver mine, if any here do, do wish, they it may find in the bellies of our fish. This is an interesting poem. It's kind of like a, an English settler's uh, bragging about how much better their settlements are than the Spanish settlements in the southern and western parts of the Americas, uh, saying that what good is all the, the gold and silver they've been able to mine? Up here in, in North America, we've discovered things like iron and lead, and we've been able to uh, plant uh, things and, and fish and that sort of thing. Here's another one from the final almanac of 1649, uh, January. While Europe burns and broils and dies in flames, and England's sobs are heard from Tweed to Thames, while Ireland's ashes up and down do fly, and Scotland's tears run down abundantly, while poor Barbados cries, the pestilence, and virgin's land thrusts out her sons from thence, the worthless orphan may sit still and bless, that yet it sleeps in peace and quietness. That's ah, a very politically laced poem here. First of all, the time period, this is January 1949, uh, the same month that Charles I was beheaded. So this is very much part of the uh, English Civil War. And he talks about how all these uh, English uh, 
uh, colonies or, or uh, other uh, principalities like Ireland and Scotland, Barbados, the Virgin Islands, how there's all kinds of problems there. And then he says, the worthless orphan may sit still and be blessed. Uh, he's talking about uh, New England. Uh, he's referring, characterizing it as something that England doesn't care much about and has kind of left them on their own there in New England and how while that may have hurt them early on in their in the colony's life when they were starving and and couldn't you know had trouble surviving uh, that's actually quite nice now because uh, since England leaves them alone the English Civil War is largely leaving them alone. Yeah, think about Samuel Danforth's poetry, what we've read here, and respond to the question on the next slide reflectively and informally. Another noteworthy uh, early colonial American poet was a guy named Edward Taylor, uh, who started off life as a, a teacher in England, uh, but he was one of those uh, Puritans who refused to sign the Act of Uniformity, uh, and as a consequence uh, was forced to emigrate to America in 1668. Uh, he wrote much of his poetry after coming to America, however, he didn't want his work published, and even stipulated in his will that his family not publish his work. Uh, however, they did donate it to the Yale Library, where a couple hundred years later it was eventually discovered uh, by a literature scholar. Taylor's poems deal with his deeply held religious views. Yeah, unlike Danforth's poems, which are mostly secular, uh, Taylor's poetry is very religious. Uh, he was a strict Puritan. He advocated for the halfway covenant. That's how, how strict his beliefs were and uh, about who he thought ought to be uh, part of the, the Puritan church and who who's not allowed. Um, and he wrote uh, poetry much like the English metaphysical poets of the time that were very popular, guys like John Donne. The uh, metaphysical poets in England at this time, their works were marked by deep philosophical exploration, uh, the use of colloquial diction, and also the widespread use of what's called a conceit. A conceit is like an extended metaphor, but it's more than just that it's a device it's a metaphorical like comparative device uh, that an entire work of literature is based around here's one of Taylor's most famous poems called Huswifery or housewife work he says make me O Lord thy spinning wheel complete thy holy word my distaff make for me make mine affections thy swift flyers neat and make my soul thy holy spool to be my conversation make to be thy real and reel the yarn there unspun of thy wheel. Throughout this poem, he compares his faith, his religious faith, to various chores that a housewife would complete, namely uh, spinning yarn, uh, sewing things, that, that sort of thing. And so this is an example of the sort of conceits that metaphysical poems are based around. This whole poem uh, is based around an extended metaphor comparing his religious devotion to the work that a housewife would normally perform. Here's another well-known Taylor poem, The Ebb and Flow. When first thou on me, Lord, wroughtst thy sweet print, my heart was made thy tinder box. My affections were thy tinder in it, where fell thy sparks by drops. Those holy sparks of heavenly fire that came did ever catch, and often out would flame. Yeah, the conceit here is the comparison to fire and all things burning. In the second stanza, he talks about uh, make my heart uh, thy censer trim. A censer uh, was like um, uh, uh, an incense bowl uh, where you would burn incense. Talks about thy altars fire and more sparks and flint and steel. So that's what's meant by a, a, poet, a poetic conceit. It's kind of that extended metaphor that runs throughout the entire text. Let's reflect now on what you've read with uh, Edward Taylor's poetry. Respond to the question on the next slide reflectively and informally.